I will now present Protecting Against Statistically Ineffective Fault Attacks, which is a joint work with Johan Dahmen, Christoph Dobraunig, Maria Eichelseder, Hannes Groß, and Florian Mendel. Now, if you want to use crypto in the wild, then you usually want to make sure that you use mathematically secure cryptographic schemes. And especially in cases where attackers could have physical access to your devices, you want to make sure that you feature some additional countermeasures against implementation attacks, such as power analysis or fault attacks. Now, in this talk, we take a closer look at one specific type of fault attacks, namely statistically ineffective fault attacks, in short, CIFAR, which were first presented at Chess in 2018. Now, CIFAR has a couple of nice properties. For once, it works pretty much out of the box against all kinds of cryptographic schemes, including block ciphers and AEID schemes. It can also circumvent typical countermeasures against fault attacks, such as redundant computation and infection. And on top of that, you only need one fault injection per cipher execution to mount this attack. Now, in a follow-up at AsiaCrypt in the same year, it was shown that CIFA cannot only circumvent fault countermeasures, but it can additionally also circumvent masking, even higher order masking or TI schemes which makes it a quite compelling choice for attacking combined countermeasures. Now, at the time, the proposed countermeasures involved using some kind of error correction or a lot of hiding or just self-destruction. And since then, many papers proposed different trade-offs that utilize error correction, but they turn out to be rather expensive, especially when combined with masking and it's also not quite sure how much error correction is actually necessary to provide practical protection. And it's also not always clear whether or not these countermeasures also deal with DFA attacks, which you probably also want to protect against in practice. So we propose more efficient countermeasures against CIFAR. And the strategy that we follow is that we essentially perform a very careful combination of redundant computation with masking. And this results in a low overhead for lightweight schemes and a, let's say moderate overhead for more bulky schemes like AES. Now, before we talk about countermeasures, I would first like to explain how these attacks actually work, starting with statistical fault attacks, which were first proposed by Fu et al. in 2013. Now, these attacks essentially exploit the fact that AES is a pseudo random permutation which essentially means that if you encrypt a set of different plain texts and you receive the corresponding set of ciphertexts and you look at one byte position of all of those ciphertexts, then the distribution of this byte should be uniform. Now, this is not only the case at the output of AES, but is also the case if you, for example, look at specific state bytes in round nine, which will be more interesting for our attack. So, um, the statistical fault attacks assume that an attacker is able to perform a repeated fault ejection in the encryption of our plain texts, such that the distribution of certain bytes within round 9 of the AS state is not uniform anymore. So there is some kind of bias in the distribution. So in our concrete example here, we assume that we inject faults that cause a bias distribution of the first state byte here in round 9. Now, when it comes to these fault injections, um, the attacker does not necessarily need to know what he is doing. He could use stuck at faults, bit flips, random faults. And most notably, he does not need to know the bias that he is causing. So as long as there is some kind of bias, he is good. Now, also notice that if we, for example, modify one byte here in round nine, then this difference will propagate to four bytes in the ciphertext due to the mixed columns operation in round 9 here. So next, let's observe that we can actually calculate 4 bytes of the AS state in round 9 from 4 bytes of a ciphertext and the corresponding 4 byte key guess in round 10. Now, we can use this for a key recovery as follows. Um, let's take a set of ciphertexts and make a key guess. For now, let's assume we make actually a correct key guess of this four byte subkey here. And we'll calculate back the value of certain bytes 
e of the s state in rod 9. And now, if we make the correct key guess, we will actually observe the bias that we have caused with our fault injections. However, if we make a wrong key guess here in round 10, then the distribution of the state beds here will always be uniform. And this is essentially what we can use to determine whether or not a key guess is correct or not. So, what about redundant computation? Um, on first glance, this should fix the problem, and it kind of does. So, let's have a look at this. So, here in this example, we now execute the encryption twice. And we assume that the attacker is only able to perform a fault injection in one of the redundant computations, again in round 9 somewhere. Now, the redundant computation ensures that the faults that actually change the output of this uh, AS encryption here never make it to the attacker because it does not match with the corresponding redundant computation. So the attacker will never get to see any faulty computations in this example. However, while redundant computation does prevent statistically fault attacks, it does not prevent a variation of this attack which is statistically ineffective for the tips. So let's have a look at this. Now let's for simplicity assume that we as the attacker perform a stack at zero fault again in route 9 at this one byte location here. Now if this stack at zero fault actually affects the, the outcome of the computation, then this effect or this computation is actually filtered out by our redundancy countermeasure. However, if the byte was already zero prior to the fault injection, then our fault is essentially ineffective. And from an attacker perspective, you still get a ciphertext that will show a bias here in round nine. And then we can simply use the same exploitation strategy as shown before. So again, we make we collect a couple of ciphertexts. This time they are correct and not faulty. We make again key guesses. And for a correct key guess, we will again see a bias here. And for an incorrect key guess, we will again see just a uniform distribution here. So this is how you can use a statistically ineffective fault attacks to circumvent countermeasures that are based on redundancy. Now, what about masking? Because at first glance, it seems like masking fixes the problem. And it kind of does. So let's first take a look at what happens if you perform a fault injection in the linear layer. So here we assume that the attacker targets one of the redundant computation and only affects one share of the mask implementation here. Now then it, we have the case that if we only affect one of the, of the shares, then there will always be the other share that will pull back the distribution of the underlying native value to a uniform distribution. So using fault injections in the linear layer of a masked and redundant computation will actually not be exploitable via CIFAR. However, the situation is different if we consider fault injections in a nonlinear operation, such as in AS, the subbytes operation. And in order to understand why, we need to take a closer look at what happens within a nonlinear operation. And to keep things simple, we just take a look at a masked end gate. So naturally, when we consider end gates, um, if the inputs are distributed uniformly, then we expect a bias at the output, because this is essentially how an end gate works. Now, this is also, of course, the case in the, in the case for masked end gate. And if we now assume that an attacker causes some kind of difference in one of the shares of, on the input, so in that case x0, so the, the difference is between this computation and the corresponding redundant computation, then we can observe that this difference cancels out, for example, in the case that both shares of y are zero, because in that case, the difference does not propagate through those two end gates here. Similarly, if both shares of y have the value one, then this difference will propagate through both of the end gates and cancel out later. So in other words, we know that if a fault is ineffective, then we actually learn something about the native value of y, because the condition whether or not the fault actually propagates through the input 
to through the end gate depends on the native value of y. And if we if we can basically probe whether or not y is zero, then this essentially um, allows us again to create some kind of bias at the output. Because if we only get to observe computations where y is zero, then also of course the output of the end gate, for example, is biased towards zero. So there is actually only zero. That's the only possible outcome now. And in the following, I will refer to such a scenario as a dangerous fault, because not all fault locations are potentially exploitable via CIFR, but this one, for example, is. So to uh, sum this up briefly, CIFR can actually circumvent both masking and redundant computation. And in principle, adding more redundancy doesn't really help because we only perform one fault injection and we only exploit correct computations. So more redundancy doesn't make any difference here. And as we've seen before, masking doesn't work and this actually also holds for higher order masking. So adding additional shares does not um, alleviate this problem. So in the remainder of this talk, I will now explain how one can actually counteract CIFR using again a combination of masking and redundant computation, but a very careful uh, combination. Okay, so first I would like to start with a bit of notation that I want to introduce. So in the paper we express a cipher as a circuit, which basically takes as input an array of errors and also produces such an output. Then we define so-called sub-circuits that basically take either a cipher's input as input or another sub-circuit's output as input. And we can recursively perform this splitting until we end up with so-called basic circuits. And they essentially only consist of very simple operations such as addition and multiplication. Now, on a high level, what we now want to do is we want to build a cipher circuit that allows us to detect all those dangerous faults that could be exploitable via CIFR. And in order to do this, we, want, we could try to make sure that such fault injections are, can be detected either at an S-box output or even better at the CIFR output. Now, in order to do this, we want to start with a traditionally masked and redundant CIFR circuit. But now we additionally require for each basic circuit that it only operates on an incomplete set of shares. And we optionally also require that these basic circuits should be permutations. Now, this is not strictly required, but if we do not have this permutation property here, then a little bit more manual work would be probably needed to ensure that all the dangerous faults can be detected. Now, in the case that we want to use permutations as basic circuits, we could either use linear functions or if we want to model a nonlinear function, this um, permutation should be a variant of the so-called Toffoli gate, which is the simplest nonlinear uh, non invertible function. So here on the right, we have an example of what a Toffoli gate looks like. It's a function that takes as input three bits and also produces a three bit output, so ABC. And the only thing that it does is it performs an XOR and an AND operation. And again, because we have an end gate, it's nonlinear and it's also um, invertible. Now, for sake of completeness, I've also put here a picture of the mask variant, since in the end we want to build mask circuits. So this is how the mask version of the Toffoli gate looks like. So let's now have a look at the concrete example that is a little bit larger than just an end gate. And for this, uh, we want to take a look at the so-called uh, 3-bit key S-box, which is the smaller version of the 5-bit Ketchak S-box. So let's first observe that we have actually a similar problem as shown before for the masked end gate. So if we assume that we induce a difference in the computation here, again, a difference to a redundant computation, then we can observe that this difference propagates into three end gates, and they are indicated here in blue. And we can also observe that for two of these end gates, the other inputs are the two shares of B. So this is again a problem because 
If we cause a difference here, then it cancels depending on B0, B1 and C1. Now C1 is not really interesting because here we only learn at most uh, one share of C. But again, this already is a problem because we essentially know that if we cause a difference here and the computation is correct, then we basically know that B was zero and this creates a bias again at the SFOX output. Now, let's take a look at a slightly different version of this 3-bit key SBOX, where each of the basic circuits are now incomplete, but not permutations. Now, again, why do we want to do this? Because we want to ensure that all dangerous faults are visible at the SBOX output. So let's have a look at what happens now. This is, again, a slightly different version of the previously shown uh, version. And what happens here is, again, we have the case that the difference propagates to our free end gates, but it now also propagates directly to the SBOX output. So here it can be now detected via an ordinary redundancy countermeasure, for example, at the SBOX output or even further at the cipher output. So some additional remarks here. Um, this presented approach can be implemented actually quite efficiently. And for lightweight S-boxes, um, there is no noticeable performance difference. For example, in the case of T3, we do not notice any difference to an ordinary masked T3 S-box. And this approach can also be implemented without uh, any fresh randomness, because for example, in the case of 3-bit key, you can write this S-box as a three times repeated application of the Toffoli gate. Now, in the paper, we do a little bit more. We also prove that our approach is applicable for all 3-bit S-boxes and actually many 4-bit S-boxes. And we also show applicability for the 5-bit key S-box. Again, this is the Ketchak S-box and affine equivalent versions of this S-box. Now, at this point, you might ask yourself, what about even larger S-boxes? For example, the one that is used in AES. And well, here we can also make use of the Toffoli gate, but now we use it for uh, bigger fields. So on a high level, we now will build a S-box description of AES that is for once based on Kenwright's description, but also grabs some ideas from Sugawara's S-box description that was presented at Chess last year. So essentially what we do is we, we take um, Sugawara's idea of his uh, free share implementation and we convert it to a two share implementation of the AS S-box description. And we do this essentially by replacing all the multiplications in F2 to the N by corresponding Toffoli gates that also operate in the same field and use an additional input that is set to zero. Now here on the right, we can see a description of an AES S-box that only relies on basic circuits that are incomplete and permutations. So we have a couple of inputs here. We have X, which is the ordinary input to the AES S-box, so eight bits. And additionally, we have the inputs A, B, C, and D, in total 18 bits that are hardwired to the value of zero. Now again, we need these additional zero inputs such that they form a Toffoli gate together with the multiplications that occur in the S-box description, such that in the end they act as permutations. Now, if we take a look at the outputs, we again have Y, which is the ordinary AS S-box output, so 8 bits, and we have additional outputs E, F, G and H. Now, if we consider a masked version of this S-box description, then intuitively X and Y, so input and output, are now twice the size, so 16 instead of 8 bits. Now, in case of the additional inputs, A, B, C, and D, we actually still only require 18 bits here, but we now require them to be random instead of zero. And the main reason for that is that we now require sharings of zero, and the easy way to get a sharing of zero is to just randomly generate one share and then to clone it. Now, this does sound kind of expensive, but it is actually not that bad because we can reuse one share of each of the additional outputs as the additional inputs in the next S-box layer. 
So this is quite nice because we only need randomness for the initial inputs and after that we can simply reuse the randomness for the next SBOX layers. Also, we do not need any additional randomness during the computation of the SBOX. There is one downside though here. Um, we cannot really do anything with, for example, the share E1, so the other share of E. And this basically means that we need to discard it, but this is a problem because E1 could contain information about the Fort injection. So to cope with that, we are forced to include redundancy checks after each SBOX computation here. Okay, some final remarks. In the paper, we give a complete description of the AES box that is resistant to a CIFR as long as the attacker does not perform more than one fault injections. We also discuss some additional implementation aspects for software and hardware. So, for example, in the paper, we mainly discuss um, CIFR protection in terms of circuit descriptions and in the paper we also specify or give recommendations how you can map these circuit descriptions into concrete software or hardware implementations. We also present an alternative countermeasure strategy against CIFAR that utilizes fine-grained redundancy checks. Now this has one advantage that this countermeasure strategy can be generalized such that it also protects against attackers that perform multi-fault CIFA. So CIFA where the attacker just performs multiple fault injections in the nonlinear operations. But the downside of offering protection against multi-fault CIFA is that the countermeasure becomes quite expensive. Now, as a side note, you do not necessarily need masking or redundancy or error correction to protect an implementation against CIFA. In fact, one could also use mode level protection against CIFAR as it, it is done by the AID schemes DRAGASCON or ISAP that are currently competing in the second round of the NIST lightweight competition. Thank you very much for your attention.